A few weeks back, there was an article in the Moscow Times that quoted State Duma Secretary Viktor Sobolev saying that Russian soldiers on the front lines should be required to shave their beards. Chechen strongman Branzam Katerov, whose Chechen volunteers are fighting alongside the Russian army, most of whom are practicing Muslim, took offense to the statement saying that Sobolev's comments were inflammatory and Islamophobic. Katerov posted on Telegram saying, Sobolev knows perfectly well who wears a beard on the front lines and why. That's why I'm quite certain that this is a provocation that looks to dampen the fighting spirit of soldiers who are fighting a holy war for the Almighty. 99% of our team wear beards, take care of it, and wear it according to Sunnah, he added, referring to the lifestyle that follows the habits of the Prophet Muhammad. Sobolev's comments may have been orchestrated by the Kremlin as a veiled warning not only to Katerov, but also other forces fighting alongside the Russian army. While the comment about beards got all the attention, reading between the lines, it isn't hard to see that Sobolev's comments were primarily about military discipline or the lack thereof. Sobolev would reply to Katerov's comments saying that he had visited the Chechen regiment and found them to be impeccable and well equipped. He went on to say demanding them to shave their beards would be silly. And military discipline has been lacking in many places and while the Russian army's conscript soldiers have a low morale which leads them to not demonstrating a lot of standard military discipline because of low pay and a lack of supplies, it's another group that is paid much better and has, by and large, much higher morale that frequently demonstrates a lack of military discipline in much more critical areas than shaving every day or two. The group in question are the Wagner mercenaries. The Wagner mercenaries were recently caught on video by a Ukrainian drone dragging one of their commanders off the field of battle and subsequently beating him with shovels. Wagner group's willingness to use prison recruits as first-line forces in human wave attacks solely for the purpose to determine where Ukrainian firing positions are and their disposition of equipment is bad enough. But when that wave falters and survivors begin to retreat the second wave, which is made up of Wagner regulars, guns them down for trying to avoid total annihilation. Prigozhin's mercenaries have good reason to fight to the death because under the Geneva Convention, they have no guarantee of proper treatment if captured and in theory shot without trial. At a Wagner-owned cemetery in the Russian town of Bakinskaya, a Maxar satellite photo from November 24th showed 17 graves. A photo taken on January 24th showed at least 121 graves. It can safely be assumed that the only Wagner mercenaries who were buried there were fighters that had joined Wagner with prior experience in the Russian military as the number of convicts they had recruited and were killed in the Battle of Bakhmut far exceeded the number of graves in this cemetery. The Wagner group's owner, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is known to be combative and person and unafraid of criticizing the Russian military high command. There are reports that Prigozhin was told in mid-January to stop publicly criticizing the Russian Defense Ministry and Army Command, but it didn't take him too long <laughs> to forget, forget what he was told. When Sobolev's comments about beards came out, Prigozhin took even more umbrage than did Ramzan Katerov. Prigozhin, an ex-convict, has only seen his star and profile on the rise since the start of the war in Ukraine. Not being a political animal himself, he has seemingly failed to comprehend his true relationship with Vladimir Putin. Seeing himself as a confidant to the Russian president, he had no reason to be diplomatic in his comments. With his higher profile now as a public figure, he took Wagner Group from being a shadowy organization into a registered corporation in October of last year when he opened a glassy headquarters building in St. Petersburg. He has deluded himself into believing that he can do or say anything he likes in Putin's authoritarian Russia. He believes that his ongoing criticisms of Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and the military brass in general and other Russian elites would either ingratiate him to Vladimir Putin or go unnoticed. He failed to heed the warning to keep his mouth completely shut and he suddenly found himself unable to advertise on Russian TV or in press outlets to recruit more mercenaries. Putin's government had given him permission to recruit in Russian prisons in late July of last year. By the end of January this year it was estimated he had recruited over 50,000 prisoners to join the Wagner ranks. In a report in the Moscow Times, the group Russia Behind Bars said that of the 50,000 prisoners recruited, 10,000 were fighting at the front. The rest had been killed, were missing, had deserted, or surrendered. Putin's government even went so far as to tell Russian news anchors and television presenters not to mention him or his company by name. 
but only to use vague references. A former Wagner mercenary, Andrei Medvedev, illegally crossed the Russian border into Norway, where he was arrested for entering the country illegally and sought asylum. His decision to flee, he said, was brought on by witnessing a host of war crimes that including the execution of deserters and other terroristic methods of the group. According to Vladimir Osechin, a founder of the exiled human rights group RussianGulag.net, Medvedev fled Russia when he was informed that his contract with Wagner was going to be extended indefinitely whether he liked it or not. For Medvedev, a contract soldier in the Russian army, he could be stop lost and his contract held forever. But he's a civilian contractor. The rules are different. Medvedev. Here he said he is more than willing to testify against senior figures in a Wagner group. He is currently being treated as a witness by Norwegian authorities. In recent days, Prigozhin has complained the Russian military is denying his mercenaries of sufficient ammunition to carry out their missions. In an audio message released on Monday, February 20th, Prigozhin sounded angry and emotional and said that he was required to, quote, apologize and obey, unquote, in order for his troops to receive ammunition. Speaking loudly on, and on occasion swearing, he said, I'm unable to solve this problem despite all my connections and contacts. The Institute for the Study of War released an assessment on Tuesday, February 21st, in which they said that Prigozhin was short of ammunition for his artillery and that he claimed that his casualties at the front had doubled because of this. The fact is, all Russian military units along the front are having their shells rationed. Shells coming out of storage have arrived at the front rusted or in other conditions where they could not be used. It sometimes it doesn't matter so much that you store them as how well you keep up the building that they're stored in. The Russian Defense Minister has rescinded Prigozhin's permission to recruit prisoners, which the Russian army is doing now, and the Wagner group was no longer able to utilize many Russian training facilities. Prigozhin recently posted a shocking photo on Telegram showing the dead bodies of some of his mercenaries and blamed their deaths on the defense minister. Prigozhin does not realize that his daily statements trumpeting those supposed victories achieved by his mercenaries and mocking his opponents has brought him all kinds of attention but it's attention for all the wrong reasons. Despite his seemingly close relationship with Putin, he has gone from being an asset to the president to being seen as a possible political rival, thereby making Wagner Group and himself of far less use to the Kremlin. Some Western analysts have seen Prigozhin as having designs on the presidency, but since he's a convicted felon, the only way he could do that would be by using his mercenaries to stage a coup. The Russian military and the FSB would not tolerate this, and he would find himself shot for treason or just dead. So Prigozhin would be well advised to stay away from high windows, stairwells, boats, and dachas in foreign countries. If what has happened to any of the oligarchs or others friends of Vlad since the start of the invasion is anything to go by, Mr. Prigozhin could well find himself well, dead by mysterious means. In the next video, we will look at who are the serious potential next presidents of Russia should anything happen to Vladimir Putin. Stay tuned, and thank you for watching.